Thank you very much. One of the wonderful things about this conversation is that it's an ongoing conversation that Ian and I have had over several years now. Um, and what is so wonderful is that Ian's ideas do not stay fixed. They move, they adapt, uh, and they're continually evolving. He is, without doubt, the preeminent speaker on this topic, um, probably on the planet, but certainly in Australia. Ian, nice to talk to you again. Welcome. Lovely to talk to you, and you can flatter me like that any time, Sandy. Well, it was the fiver you slipped me earlier. It made a big difference. Um, <laughs> one of the things I'd like to start with is a, a general picture. We will come to questions towards the end, by the way, so you will have a chance to have a say. I, I, I guess I'd like to start with the state of play, and if you could do a, a, a pretty brief um, report card, first of all on the world, and, and one of the things that's received a lot of publicity lately has been the state of the ice sheets in the, in the, uh, around the northern regions and the southern regions, and devastating in the fact that they're not just shrinking but thinning, which was news to me. Where is the science with on that at the moment? Well, there was a, an international conference in Copenhagen last week which pulled together 2,500 of the world's leading climate scientists. And basically what they said is that if you're not alarmed, you're not paying attention, that um, the climate is clearly changing. Uh, but most alarmingly, it's changing faster than the science was predicting even 10 years ago, um, possibly even faster than the IPCC was predicting in its fourth assessment report, because that was based on science up to the end of 2006. And uh, the Arctic ice is shrinking faster than was predicted then, uh, and we're seeing other changes. Um, uh, I just wrote a piece for the Australian Conservation Foundation about February in Australia, and I reminded people that when I wrote Living in the Greenhouse 20 years ago, the science was saying that by the 2020s, we'd probably see incontestable evidence of climate change. It would probably account to it being warmer, uh, it being drier in the south and wetter in the north, uh, so perhaps more prolonged uh, periods of very hot weather, uh, maybe more serious bushfires, possibly more serious floods in the north, possibly even the spread of vector-borne diseases. And in February we saw extraordinarily long, very hot, dry spells in South Australia and Victoria, culminating in the dreadful fires in Victoria, floods in North Queensland, uh, and the east coast of New South Wales. And dengue Wales, fever. And uh, an outbreak of dengue fever yeah. in Cairns. So, uh, of course, no one event can be inarguably and incontestably ascribed to climate change, but the overall pattern is that we are seeing in 2009 what the science was saying we'd probably see by the 2020s or the 2030s. Was there something wrong with the scientific method back then? Or is it the lag time between scientific observation and scientific reporting and all of that peer assessment stuff that slows down uh, the access to the general public of the latest information? Well, the lag time slows down science. And uh, in that sense, the IPCC reports are always out of date because they're always based on the peer review science that's already in the literature when they start their process, which means it's based on measurements that were done about a year before that. Uh, but there's a, a more fundamental problem, I think, which is that uh, the science is based on effects that can be measured and therefore projected. But we're now seeing at play a range of non-linear changes that are accelerating the process of climate change. Well, let, let's pause and go to the, the subject of ice, which was my, my, my first report card tick. What other changes are we seeing? Are you talking about things like the exposure of not a reflective ice surface but an ocean surface giving a temperature warming? Is this the sort of thing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, as ice melts, uh, more solar radiation is absorbed because ocean absorbs more solar radiation than snow or ice, which reflects most of it. So as it gets warmer, the ice melts, which means more sunlight is absorbed, which means it gets warmer, which means more snow and ice melts, which means it gets warmer. As it gets warmer, the forests get drier, they're more likely to catch fire and put carbon dioxide in the air, which means it gets warmer, which means the forests get drier, which means... Runaway acceleration. And um, 
a, a third effect that we're now able to measure is that as it's got warmer in the polar regions, more methane is being released from the Arctic tundra. Methane's a very powerful greenhouse gas, which is warming the earth, which is releasing more methane. So there are a, a string of these uh, feedback loops that are accelerating climate change in ways that scientists feared this might happen, but there was no way of quantifying them, no way of putting a number on the probability of this happening. So is this exponential? I mean, are, are we seeing rapidity added to rapidity? Well, yes, we are, and that's mm -hmm. why the uh, Copenhagen Science Conference said uh, two degrees of warming already looks dangerous. Three degrees of warming, the consequences look quite unthinkable for human civilization. Now, the worry about that is that about the most optimistic view is that if globally we control greenhouse gas emissions and if the science where it's uncertain comes in at the optimistic end rather than the pessimistic end, we might get away with only two degrees of global warming. Uh, but if politicians continue to think that making the gross domestic product even grosser is more important than controlling climate change, there's absolutely no chance of... Uh, uh, stabilising the climate anywhere near two degrees. All right. So we can give a tick. Ice is reduced in, in coverage, but also in thickness. So therefore, water is rising. Let's talk about water for a moment, but not the ocean water. What about water resources on the planet? It seems to me that the potential for social unrest around water is a problem which we don't always look at when we're talking about climate change? Well, people have been saying for a couple of decades that we're likely to see wars fought between nation states over water uh, because each nation state tends to see the river flowing through it as its property. But if you think of the, the major rivers of Southeast Asia, like the Mekong, for example, they flow through four or five countries and what one country does affects the downstream resources. I mean, we see the same thing at a, a smaller level within well, Australia. Level, yes. uh, when uh, we have a Queensland minister saying, basically, uh, bugger New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, if rain falls in Queensland, we're going to grab it here. Mm. Uh, whereas historically, the rain that fell in Queensland ran into the Darling, it flowed through New South Wales and uh, yes. Western Victoria into South Australia. So uh, people in South Australia are really at the bottom end of the Murray and they're seeing the consequences of beggar my neighbour type policies in, the, in all of the states upstream. And uh, if we can't manage the Murray-Darling system within one nation with just the trivial differences between lines drawn on the map by 18th century colonial bureaucrats, it's very difficult to see how the problem can be managed between different sovereign nations who've been fighting each other for 5,000 years. Climate science was saying 20 years ago that we'll see in the tropics in particular what the scientists call a more vigorous hydrodynamic cycle. Basically, it'll be hotter, so there'll be more evaporation. What goes up must come down, so there'll be, be heavier rainfall. But the rainfall in temperate regions like southern Australia is driven by cold fronts moving through in the winter. And again, it's not rocket science that as it gets warmer, yep. those cold fronts get weaker and move further south. So it was predictable and predicted 20 years ago that it would get drier in Western, southwest Western Australia, in South Australia and Victoria, would get wetter on the west coast of Tasmania and on the South Island of New Zealand, and uh, all of that has happened. We already have something like 1.1 billion people without access to clean drinking water. But the more worrying thing in global terms is that climate change is reducing the availability of water in places where food production is already constrained by water availability, which is sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. So famines would be an outcome of that? Uh, absolutely. And uh, even though there's some compensation for that in increased grain production in areas where it's temperature limited, like Canada and Russia, there's no way even in principle you can ship the extra grain from Canada and Russia to sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Right. So uh, in that sense, climate change is uh, perversely massively redistributing food availability from the places where there is already plenty of food to the places where there is already a shortage. So we've done ice, we've done water. Oil is the next one I wanted to touch on. It seems all those that talk over the last few decades about peak oil, mm. 
and I notice some people are still talking about it as a coming thing, but it occurs to me that we've already passed that. The peak oil has probably occurred in, what, 2000 or something like that. What's your feeling about that? Well, uh, I remember giving a public lecture in this city in 1977 in which I pointed out that the best estimate of when world oil production would peak was about 2010. And I said, fortunately, that gives us 30 years to plan a smooth transition away from assuming cheap oil uh, to an age when oil will no longer be plentiful and cheap. Uh, and you know exactly how we've used that 30 years. Uh, basically, our entire urban transport planning has been based on the clearly uh, bogus presumption that there will always be cheap oil. Now, um, the oil analysts are still a bit divided. Some think that peak oil actually happened five years ago. Some think it might be five years into the future. But in a sense, it doesn't really matter whether the optimists or pessimists are right. World oil production, if it hasn't already peaked, will peak within the next few years. After that, it's downhill all the way. And um, that was inevitable because we're using oil at about a million times the rate at which it's been produced. So essentially, we are using a one-off geological endowment. And uh, I've been saying for some time that if we were a rational species, we'd already be keeping the oil, the limited stocks, for the uses for which it's really the only uh, vector, like civil aviation and yes. lubricants. Um, but at the moment, uh, we're still encouraging people to... We're spending the inheritance. ...for surface transport, yeah. and even doing dippy things like fueling vehicles and driving them around in circles just to see which one can go the fastest. And in some states, we even find state governments that are prepared to subsidise this futile activity. But... Uh, but I digress. I mean, the, the crucial point is that uh, not just... I was just going to say, Mike, those two tickets to the Formula One, you're not interested in them. No, probably not. <laughs> uh, not just our transport, but if you think about it, our, our food supply yeah. is entirely predicated on the presumption that we can grow our food some distance away from the city, and we've quite cheerfully concreted over the best food-producing land in the southern suburbs of Brisbane uh, for housing, based on the presumption that we can just bring food from further and further away. And if this was a one-off, it would be sad enough, but it's happening in every city around the world. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, what it all comes down to is the, the, the most fundamental problem, that um, our leaders tend to have a time horizon of the next election, whereas they really should have a time horizon of the next generation or the generation beyond that. And while ever they're like, more concerned about... Sounds the like political sustainability, and that just doesn't happen. Well, uh, I think it could. I mean, the interesting thing is that where visionary leaders do treat people like adults instead of giving them spin and orchestrated baloney and admit that these are hard issues and that uh, we might have to do some things that aren't attractive in the short term for the sake of our own children, I think people respond to that. And I think people are sick and tired of being treated like idiots and uh, being given spin and baloney by politicians who say essentially... Trust us, uh, you know, there'll always be cheap oil, uh, the climate won't change. When uh, they see pictures of polar bears on shrinking ice flows and uh, uh, they see the graphs of uh, oil production, they know they're being lied to, and I think they've, they've had about enough of it. Mm. The, the last one on that little list for our, our global report was population, because that's another issue that seems intractable. Well... Uh, it's intractable if you think that growth is inevitably good. I mean, the interesting counterexample is that the Chinese leadership 30 years ago worked out that the social pain of imposing a one-child policy in the short term was better than the huge social pain of mass starvation in the 2020s and 2030s. Look how they were criticised politically at the time around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the, the rough figures are that there would have been three or four hundred million more people in China today than there are had the one-child policy not been implemented. Now, that's not to deny that there are huge social problems particularly in a world where technology makes it possible to decide whether that one child will be male or female, and in a patriarchal society that means there'll be a huge imbalance of, of male to female births and so on. But um, the, the fundamental point is that no species can increase without limit in a closed system. And if we don't stabilise our population in ways that are socially acceptable, it will be limited by disease and starvation and fighting amongst ourselves.
and most of us would want a better future than that for our children. So I've argued that in general, a sustainable society has to have stabilised its population and its consumption at levels that can be sustainably supported. That seems to me self-evident. But we still have governments that are so alarmed by the fact that our population is only increasing by 300,000 a year that they provide incentives to people to have more children. They encourage it with facile slogans like one for mum, one for dad, and one for Peter Costello. And, uh, and then they boost migration uh, allegedly to solve skill shortages at a time when there's rising unemployment. It, uh, it's, and it's all because in the short term there are economic benefits to a growing population, uh, ignoring the long-term consequences. Mm, I think you missed out on the subtlety that one for Peter Costello for most people turned out to be a very effective contraceptive. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the wonderful things, I don't know how many of you have read um, Ian's A Big Fix, uh, this has just been updated, and I, I've reread it over the last couple of days. What really struck me in this is that you go to great lengths to explain some basics which we take for granted often because the language is so familiar, but we really don't get it. So can you just give us your picture of what you call sustainability? What is sustainability? Well, I'm a simple soul, Sandy, and it seems to me sustainability means ability to be sustained. I mean, yeah. call me a nitpicking academic pedant if you like, but I think... You're I think a nitpicking <laughs> academic pedant, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a sustainable society is one that is able to be sustained, if not forever, certainly for the foreseeable yeah. future. And that means that it would be not running down the resource base in ways that will deprive future generations of opportunities, would not be damaging its environmental resources, would not be overusing renewable resources like water and forests and fisheries, uh, would probably be moving towards a greater degree of social equity because an unequal society will always be socially unstable and it would have some sort of spiritual basis for the long term that's uh, a bit more sophisticated than consume, be silent and die, let's, which is let's our just current a, spiritual basis. Let's just pick a couple of those apart for a moment. When you talk about social equity, give me some examples of the sorts of tensions that an unequal society will bring about. Well, uh, let me give I you mean, three. Because we are dealing with a society here which is, and, and more and more around the world, where the market economy, which seems to me fundamentally a problem in this, the market economy says growth is good, but in the end it ends up with m fewer and fewer people with more and more, and a greater number of people with less and less. Is that what you're talking about when you're talking about that, that, social that, That's absolutely right, and uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise even to economists, because Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, that uh, if you allocate resources by a market, inevitably those who have will get more and those who don't have, uh, somebody's called it the Matthew Principle because mm. there's a verse in the Gospel of St Matthew that says something like, to them that hath more shall be given and to them that hath not, even the little which they hath shall be taken away. <laughs> uh, and if you allocate resources through a market, those with more money will always get what they want and those with less money will always have fewer choices. So we live in a world where the total production of food is enough for every person to have two kilograms of food a day. A kilogram of fruit and veggies, half a kilogram of protein, half a kilogram of cereals and pulses. More than any reasonable person could consume without uh, having a weight problem and, and health problems. But 850 million don't have enough to eat. And if we're frank about it, cats and dogs in Australia eat better than people in some parts of the world because we can afford to buy for our cats and dogs levels of protein that uh, people in Zambia or yep. Bangladesh... Tuna supreme with of. vegetables. Yeah. 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 Uh, second point is that there's been a very interesting study done by Richard Wilkinson on the health impacts of inequality. And we know that in poor, poor countries, people die because... They don't have clean drinking water, they don't have adequate nutrition, they don't have reasonable shelter, they don't have decent health care. And up to a, a level of average income of about $4,000 per year, uh, 
there is a strong relationship between average income and health outcomes. And poor people in the poorest parts of the world are dying because they can't afford clean drinking water and decent nutrition. The really interesting thing is that above an average income level of $4,000 a year, there is absolutely no relationship at all between average income and health outcomes, but there's a very strong negative relationship between income inequality and health outcomes. In other words, uh, if a society gets richer but becomes more unequal, uh, life expectancy actually declines. And at the extreme, you get examples like the USA, which is by far the richest country in the world in per capita income terms, where the life expectancy is basically the same as in Cuba, where the per capita income is about 1% of that in the USA, because what little they have in Cuba is more or less equitably distributed, and they have decent health care, whereas what they have in the US is very unequally distributed. And I think we're seeing in Australia now partly the consequences of globalisation, but a clear widening of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. If you embrace globalisation, it means that wages in labour-intensive activities are driven down to the levels of third-world sweatshops. So you can't afford to make T-shirts in Australia if Australians are paid more than uh, people in, in Chinese sweatshops. At the other extreme, managerial salaries are inflated to telephone numbers to give us the managerial excellence we've seen in... You know, HIH and FIA and Storm and Telstra and other Australian success stories. Yeah, pick, pick a company, any company, yes. Yeah, to, to compete yeah. in the international market for the best managerial talent. So uh, when you and I were young, the ratio of managerial salaries in the largest companies to the basic wage was about a factor of five. Yeah. Today it's more like a factor of 500. Yeah. And you really wonder when you see people paid $30 million a year, I mean... It would be quite a challenge in a lifetime to spend $30 million. How could anyone need $30 million in a year? Mm, two Learjets. Yeah. That's the problem, is that it, it actually accelerates the level of consumption. That's right. And, yeah. But the, the really interesting thing is that a study done by the Australia Institute found that not only have we not become more happy as we've become wealthier, we've not become more contented in the last 30 years, even though... On average, we now have twice as much money as we had 30 years ago. But more interestingly, the further up the income pyramid you are, the less likely you are to be contented. So that when they ask people, do you agree or not with the statement, I can't afford to buy all the things that I really need, people in the top 10% of the income distribution were more likely to say yes to that than people in the bottom 10%. Because needs are limited, but greed is unlimited. And the more we have, the more we are encouraged to believe that we really need. So the need concern... is limited, greed is unlimited. That's mm. something to take away with you. That's, yeah. that's and the wonderful. concern is that the whole economic system is oriented towards, what was it Clive Hamilton said, persuading us to use money we don't have to buy things we, we don't, don't want need. to impress yeah. people we don't like. Yes. And, uh, but, but and, Ian, and that's clearly not sustainable. Given the current economic crisis, and I wasn't actually going to talk about this with you today, but it's... You brought it up neatly, so let's do that. We're about to see a meeting of the G20 to try and reorganise the uh, international financial system. Surely there's no chance that they're going to change the model away from the market-driven model that has been part of the problem and not part of the solution. And yet, at this very moment in time, with climate change, it will be the perfect moment to change the model. Absolutely, and, and I think the model does need changing. Uh, Kevin Rudd's written an article in The Monthly. I mean, who thought we'd ever see a Prime Minister of Australia... Who could write, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been a while anyway, hasn't it? It's been a while since we had one who could read. <laughs> but, but one who could write an article. And it's, it's an interesting article in which he blames the extremes, the Washington consensus, the idea that the market is always best for the economic problems that we've experienced. And I think at one level that's clearly right. But at another level, the economic problems are a result of the other issues like climate change and peak oil. I mean, I think I can make a reasonable case that the 
factor which triggered the subprime crisis, which in turn caused the unravelling of the financial system, was exactly what the doco, the end of suburbia, yep. predicted as the outcome of peak oil, which was that it would become unsustainable to live in the outer suburbs of American cities and drive in large inefficient cars to where you could find work. So people would walk away from those suburbs and they would become abandoned. The subprime mortgages would collapse and this would put pressure on the financial system, exactly what happened. Now, the heartening thing is that even bodies as conservative as the World Economic Forum have been saying in the last three months, the financial crisis is not an isolated problem. It's not simply a problem of the economic institutions or our financial structures or regulation. It's related to the problems of population growth, increasing consumption, peak oil, uh, which they call energy security, um, climate change, food and water. And they argued at their summit on the global agenda that we need to discuss all of these problems together, that we can't patch up the financial system without ignoring the drivers which are the problem. And Barack Obama recognises that. If you look at his rescue package for the US economy, there's 55 billion US dollars, a um, huge amount of money, uh, being put into clean energy and energy efficiency and improving public transport, which has been systematically run down over the last 30 years. So Obama gets it. I don't think Gordon Brown gets it, and I don't think Kevin Rudd gets it. I think they're still behaving as if this was just an economic issue, and if only we get the banks uh, secure and the banks confident mm. to lend, then the economy will right itself. Because but, all the time, the, 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 the journalists who are writing about this crisis refer constantly to the latest movement on Wall Street, the fact that the market is recovering or our dollar is recovering, it seems that nothing has been learned from that.